So I, I'm called a river roaring. And people often say, well, what in the world is a river roaring? And a river roaring is someone who, uh, <laughs> 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 but I don't get the respect we deserve. <laughs> It's a combination. It's, we, it's like a historian, only we specialize in rivers. And so, it, but keep in mind the word war is in there. It means we don't have to tell the truth, <laughs> historians. Uh, but just so you'll know the difference, if I tell a little lie or maybe stress the truth, I'll confess afterwards so you'll know the difference. <laughs> no confession, it's the truth, as far as you know. <laughs> Even Mark Twain once said he never let the truth get in the way of a good story. <laughs> yeah. So over the years I've been serving this on um, the Mississippi Queen, the Delta Queen, the American Queen, mostly the American Queen. It's the largest steamboat in the world. Uh, carries 430 passengers and a crew of 180. It's a very large steamboat. It carries passengers on usually seven day cruises on the river. So my job was to do daily talks. Uh, serve as a guide, announce things along the way, spend time in what we call the chart room, uh, announcing interesting things along the way. So it's a great job. I, in fact, COVID, when COVID came and shut us down uh, about a year and a half, I did retire during that time. So COVID kind of retired me. Living down in Louisiana, where I am now, uh, in Cajun country, I kind of turned feral a little bit. <laughs> it's just being on a boat with 600 other people just didn't appeal to me right now. So. And I'm enjoying it down there doing that. So, uh, but over the years, you know, the Wabash River, uh, when I was a kid, I used to imagine, where did that water come from? Where did it go? And, and, uh, and I started studying the river a little bit. And I followed the Lewis and Clark expedition, began to study that. And then I began to travel the river, mostly originally canoes. I canoed the entire river uh, from the beginning to the end. And uh, uh, short trips, long trips. And then I finally, though, got motor. I got a boat with a motor on it. Then I was mobile. I could go places when you have a motor on the boat. And uh, this is a boat that I did most of my traveling in. This is a, a center console boat. This is back in the early 90s and I still I still own that boat. It's, it's the same boat. Just looks better now than it used to. I fixed it up a lot and so I still travel in that boat. I have it down in Louisiana and I still travel. That boat's uh, 47 years old, still bone strong. But uh, that logo, I'm also a member of the Cajun Navy. And the Cajun Navy, we actually do uh, uh, rescue work for great flooding, search and rescue work for great flooding. And that boat is ideal for it because it's a low freeboard. It's just close to the water, runs shallow, it's got a lot of power. And it's the, really, the best thing we use it for is animal rescue. It's easy to get animals on and off that boat. I don't get out and get the animals on the boat. I let the young guys do that. I just drive. It's my job to drive to do that. So she's a great boat. I still have that boat. Some of you may remember this boat, the Wabash Queen. And I actually took an old houseboat, rebuilt it, drove it into a paddle wheel drive, and had it on the Wabash River, the Wabash Queen. And uh, you know, years before that, I had bought a ship's wheel in a nautical shop. And I thought, I've got to have that wheel paid too much for it. It hung on the wall for years, <laughs> waiting for the day that I would build a boat under that wheel. <laughs> and there it is. There's that wheel right there on the top of that boat there, for the Wabash Queen. But uh, I also, during my years, and, and you know, I mentioned my passion for the Lewis and Clark expedition, I began to do a show, and I portrayed William Clark in the show, and uh, on stage. And so I was him for an hour. I was totally William Clark doing that show, right down to the, the costume that he might have worn during that time. So I really enjoy, I still do that show now and then on special venues. But uh, that was the greatest river expedition in American history. And I've followed the trail all the way out to Oregon and back as close as I could. And so it's a, it's a great trip and I like to spread the word about it. Now what's interesting is during these presentations, I have no time for questions. So I stay in my time period this is 1803 to 1806. And so I, I don't deviate from that. When we get into questions, people try to trip me up sometimes. <laughs> and uh, like a gentleman who said that, now I saw on a TV television documentary, something that different from what I talked about. I said, what's television? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna stay in that time period during that. So I enjoy that show. But as uh, Tom mentioned over the years, I've written several books. The first one being the Wabash 
river guidebook. And I'll talk a little bit more later about how that came about. But uh, that's enough about me. I want to talk about the Wabash River. Now this river is, people will often ask me, and I've traveled rivers all over the country, thousands of miles, and hundreds of rivers, and they'll say, what's your favorite river? And I have a definitive answer, the Wabash. The Wabash is home. And it's a very special river in a lot of ways. And so I do miss the Wabash, and I don't get here as much as I'd like to, but uh, it, it has a special place in my heart. It's, it's, a, uh, it's such a natural river in a lot of ways. It's beautiful, it's getting prettier and cleaner every year. The, a lot of the wildlife I'll be talking about is coming back and flourishing uh, because of those better conditions. So yeah, the Wabash is still my favorite, always will be my favorite river there when I talk about rivers. But it's an important river also. Historically, it's important. You know, the first people who traveled the rivers were the Native Americans. Well, before that, they were actually the mound builders were here before the Native Americans. Uh, and they, but I used to sit by that river and just imagine what it was like when Tecumseh was paddling up and down this river and going up the Prophet's Town and back. And so uh, uh, they were the first, but the first commercial type boats were the flatboats. And Terre Haute had a lot of flatboats going down the river. Flat, there were several pork uh, places in Terre Haute that did, uh, 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 what do they do to pork? Man, they don't manufacture, process it. thank you. Any help I can get, I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, process that pork. Anyway, they, they, so a lot of pork barrels and pork barrel parts went down there uh, on the river. And the other things, there was all sorts of things begin to float down the river in flatboats. There were even services. There were floating blacksmiths going down the river. There were all sorts of things. There were even, you probably seen westerns that had these wagon to go to town to town selling those elixirs, those cure -alls. They were going down the river in flatboats doing the same thing. It didn't cure anything. <laughs> Made you feel better because often it was laced with cocaine. But, uh, but anyway, flatboats were abundant and many of them departed Terre Haute, the port of Terre Haute, because uh, it was a, the main center. And these were one-way boats. Now they had no means of propulsion other than the current and they had little means of steering. They had a, a, they had a sweep and they had a oar. And uh, I should, I got two pictures here. I should go about back and forth here and point this thing out. But anyway, uh, but these flatboats being going down this river, they were, they were not real built boats. And they were dangerous. There were a lot of hazards on the river. Snags, shoals, whirlpools, all these things. There were some hazards on the rivers. And many ended up in the bottom of the river. There were also the hazard that the hostile Indians could uh, attack them at any time going down the river. And uh, as they were, they, they, but their destination was way down the river. See, these didn't go back up. They were one-way boats, only went downstream. But another hazard they had that most people don't realize were pirates. There were pirates down the rivers. You've heard the pirates of the high seas, we had pirates of the low seas. And these pirates were not <laughs> nice guys. I mean, they would uh, attack these flatboats and take all their goods and very often their lives. Sometimes they'd use trickery to stop these flatboats. They would put one of their ladies on the head of an island or a beachhead, and a poor damsel in distress, and seemingly all alone, well, of course, they would steer that flatboat to save this poor woman, and not knowing, hiding behind the trees and the bushes and the rocks were the pirates who would attack them. So they were predominant on the lower Wabash and the lower Ohio River, particularly. And uh, it was, so it, it was a dangerous thing to do for these, these flatboaters. Now, assuming they got past the river and they got past the pirates, what was their destination? Well, most of the time it was the Mississippi River. It could be uh, all the way from, it could be Natchez, Vicksburg, Baton Rouge, New Orleans, any of these cities on the Mississippi River. Natchez was a big port then, because ships could come up all the way to Natchez at times. And Natchez under the hill was the port, a rough and tough place, Natchez under the hill. Had about every temptation known to man. And that was the destination for many of these flat books too. And so they would land at Natchez under the hill, having went through all these dangers, and Natchez under the hill was full of scoundrels, thieves, crooks, robbers, just waiting for these flat books to land and get their money in their hands. You see, they would sell their goods and then take the boats apart and sell the wood 
and walk home. And so, assuming they were smart enough to get out of Natchez with their lives and their money, they would walk the Natchez Trace. And this is an old, uh, used to be a buffalo trail, became an Indian trail, and became this trail for these flat boaters. What's waiting along the way? Robbers, land pirates. So they, they, the ones who were smart enough with safety and numbers to protect themselves to do this. So they would take this long route, which would take months to get all the way back up to Terre Haute or other ports they went to, and they would build another boat and do it again. I'd have found a different way to make a living. I love rivers, but it just doesn't sound like a good way to make a living.